Alright, so uh, hi everyone. I'm Nathan. I study biophysics here at UBC. And the research I'm going to present is actually part of an ongoing project and was conducted at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Deutschland. And uh, my presentation is about how we can model aerosol based respiratory therapies using atomic force microscopy. Um, so I'm going to try and make my presentation as interactive as possible. So I might throw something at the crowd here today. Um, so I'm going in the first row and keep on your toes. All right. So respiratory cancer is a disease characterized by normal cell growth in the lungs. And it is responsible for 1.38 million, million deaths every year. Now a developing treatment for respiratory cancer is, involves patients inhaling drugs that are in aerosol form. So the advantages of aerosol-based respiratory therapy will allow a high concentration of drugs to be delivered to a selective region of the lungs. And because these drugs only go into the airways, this is going to minimize side effects to other normal healthy tissues. Uh, however, if only certain regions of the lungs are affected, then the drugs need to be targeted to those specific areas, as you can see in my diagram over there. And a new therapy that is being currently developed involves magnetic targeting of magnetic drug particles. But unfortunately, this has not been widely characterized yet. Uh, one of the challenges to magnetic targeting is the branching nature of the respiratory system, making direct targeting quite difficult. And another setback is the anatomy of the lungs themselves. So the airways are going to be covered in a thin 10 micrometer layer of mucus, and that functions to trap dust and debris that has entered the respiratory system. Uh, the mucus is viscoelastic, or non-Newtonian, so it does not have a constant viscosity. And that means the viscosity will change depending on the forces that are acting on the fluid. And below this mucus layer, there's a periciliary layer that sweeps the trapped debris back towards the mouth, where it can be expelled or swallowed into the stomach. So if we consider that the force is acting on one of these magnetic particles, there's going to be a magnetic force in green, a drag force in red, and a hydrodynamic force created by the motion of the fluid. Now this simplified model can be used to determine how a drug particle and a mucus film interact. Uh, but as you can expect, the forces on these small particles are extremely small themselves, with a magnitude in the nanonewtons. Uh, so this creates difficulty in measuring the drag magnetic and hydrodynamic forces. So since magnetic targeting has not been widely characterized yet, we can simplify our model by considering only non-magnetic particles, and this will make the magnetic force negligible, and, but of course, this force must be studied in future research in order for drug targeting to become a reality. So the forces in particle film interactions need to be studied first. And these forces, such as the drag force, depends on uh, parameters like the viscosity, eta, the relative velocity of the particle with respect to the fluid, v, the diameter of the particle, and the inverse surface area, a. And hydrodynamic force depends on, again, the fluid viscosity eta, the radius of the meniscus that is formed between the particle and the fluid, the velocity of the particle, the HDT, uh, the radius of the particle, big R, and the distance between the particle and the solid surface underneath the liquid film, or H. Now, the nanonewton drag and hydrodynamic force it can actually be measured using atomic force microscopy. So what is atomic force microscopy? So what it is, is a particle made of either polystyrene or silica can be attached to the end of a cantilever, which has a known spring constant. And this entire structure, known as the colloidal probe, will approach and retract from the sample. And our sample is going to be a cross-linked liquid film with similar non-Newtonian properties as mucus. So I actually have some cantilevers over here with me today that I'm going to pass around. So uh, please have a look. Hands up. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm a bit terrible with ultimate. So uh, the cantilever is actually at the end of those silicon chips, and they're only about 50 micrometers long. 
Uh, so you have to look at those closely. So to really understand this figure over here, I want everyone to hold out their palm. Yeah, don't be shy. All right, so this is your liquid film uh, with the salt support underneath. And then you take your finger, this is your colloidal probe, and as it moves up and down on your liquid film, it will bend due to the interactions of the cantilever with the film. So the distance that the cantilever bends, that is known. Uh, the spring constant, that's also known. So we can calculate the force using Hooke's law that you can see over there. So this measurement sequence is actually best summed up uh, with this diagram here. So as the chloro probe approaches and retracts from the liquid film, there are two very important events that we have to take a look at. The first one is the jump in, uh, C, and the second one is the jump out. So as the chloro probe approaches the film, a meniscus is going to form even before the particle comes into contact with the film. And this is caused by short range forces, such as van der Waals, and it also depends on the viscoelasticity and non newtonian properties of the film. And as the chloro probe retracts, from the film, another meniscus will be stretched, and that's, this will oppose the motion of the particle. Uh, this is caused by drag and hydrodynamic forces, and the thickness of the meniscus, the high H over there, that will depend on non Newtonian properties of the fluid. So, by analyzing the jump in and jump out events, we can characterize how a drug particle will interact with a non Newtonian mucus layer. So this measurement sequence is actually best summarized using a force curve, and this is a sample force curve that you can see over here. It is of a not Newtonian fluid, so one with a constant viscosity. And the force applied on the colloidal probe, that's on the y-axis, is going to be negative because the force is always downwards as the colloidal probe is pulled into the film. And the distance between the particle and the film is on the x-axis. So we read this graph moving from right to left on approach and from left to right on retract. So taking a look at the approach curve in red, uh, we can see the steep portion between points B and C. That is the jump in event uh, when the particle is first pulled into the film. And that vertical section D on the approach curve, that's when the particle comes into contact with the solid support underneath the film. Uh, so this uh, force curve resulted in those values for the jump in, jump out, distance, and force. And uh, if we take a look at the retract curve in black, uh, we can see that the jump out distance is much larger than on approach. And recall that the meniscus that was formed on retract when the particle moved away from the solid support is going to be larger. And uh, that corner on the black curve right over there, right by the approach, uh, that represents the exact time when the film detached from the particle. So if we compare this force curve to a force curve for a non-Newtonian sample, you can see it looks quite different. So the approach curve no longer has a short spike for the jump in, as we saw in the Newtonian sample. And that's because of the viscoelasticity of the fluid, making it more resistant to deformation. So this means that the fluid has a harder time being pushed out of the way before the particle can touch the solid support underneath the film. So that's why there's no vertical jump in that we saw before. And our retract curve also has an entirely different shape. So this vertical part on the left side, again, that is when the particle was in contact with the solid support. And as the particle pulls away, as we're moving to the right, uh, the fluid must fill the space between the particle and the solid support. And this is more difficult due to non-Newtonian fluids, for non-Newtonian fluids, excuse me, due to their viscoelasticity, or again, the resistance to deformation. So non-Newtonian fluids will produce a larger drag and hydrodynamic force, and this results in a greater jump out force and distance. So these results are part of the strong model for how drug particles interact with the mucus layer, and uh, that can be shown in two main points. The first one being that the jump in and jump out distance increased in the non-Newtonian sample. This means that uh, the non-Newtonian viscoelastic fluid will apply a force on the particle over a longer length scale, and will also remain in contact for a much longer time period. 
The mucus layer in the airways therefore interacts with aerosol-based drugs strongly and will pull the particle into the film at a greater distance even before the particle touches the film. The second main point is that the jump out force increased on retraction for a non-Newtonian film. And this is evidence to support that non-Newtonian fluids will apply larger forces on particles due to drag and hydrodynamic forces. And therefore, the viscoelastic non-Newtonian properties of mucus will promote drug deposition and retention in the airways. However, this also means that drugs must be designed to act on a shorter time scale than the mucus clearance. Otherwise, the drugs may move from a cancerous region to a healthy region, and this will decrease the effectiveness of such a treatment. So these findings provide strong support for the feasibility of aerosol-based respiratory therapies, and further studies will need to look into magnetic targeting of these particles. And it is our hope that one day, targeted aerosol therapy will be a treatment option for lung and respiratory cancer. Uh, so thank you very much.